In the early 1960s, the area of northwestern Australia called the Pilbara saw a great explosion. When the dust has settled and history is objectively written, this great explosion of industry may be largely attributed to the man who discovered these great deposits of high-grade iron ore and who fought single-mindedly for their development. Pastoralist, prospector and mining entrepreneur, Langley George Hancock. Mr Hancock, your, your public image always seems to represent you as being a sort of human bulldozer who uh, likes to get his own way and can't be deviated and a, and a bit of a loner. How did you achieve that, do you think? I um, presume the, the loner part of it is a, a natural upbringing of a, a chap who's been uh, and alone most of his working life. Uh, when I left school, Hale School, I went to the bush and then for six months on end, you might say, I was on my own except for blackfellas and the mustering camp and so on and so forth. Um, on the station Mulga Downs, at that time we only had one shearing shed and the property was nearly 90 miles long. So we had to muster up 35,000, 40,000 sheep and drove them right down the other end um, to the shearing shed. And then when that had been shorn, you had to drive them back again and disperse them into the various paddocks. There's some 50 or 60 paddocks on Mulga Down, 65 windmills and so on and so forth. So you're constantly in the, in the saddle. And in those days, I mean, the, um, the, what you had for stockmen were um, the aboriginals. So probably from that, um, then, you learn to be, I think, on your own, you learn to be self-reliant because there are no such things as flying doctors in those days. There are no such things as around the corner shops. Uh, I mean, there's no baker to deliver bread. Um, there was no butter and jam was a luxury. Uh, and uh, the camels used to come out, the camel wagons, it was too rough for horses, used to come out and they could be anything up to three or four months late breaking down and, and they would bring out the supplies well of course by the time that they got out the flour was weevily and so on and so forth so uh, you, you have to live uh, and rely upon yourself so i, I think that uh, um, in the, you, it's a totally different life to what it is now uh, what every people people do now they sit down put out their hand and howl for the government to uh, supply them with this, supply them with that, supply them with everything that they can think of. The government, the national theme of Australia now, or the national anthem of the government order. This is the way people. Uh, this is the way people expect to live. Whereas in those days, uh, the um, if you didn't uh, uh, look for yourself, uh, that that was the finish of it. Because nobody else was going to look after you. You came from a a line of rugged individuals, didn't you? Because um, wasn't Emma Withnell um, a forebear of yours? The yeah, she was, a, she, uh, she was a Miss Hancock. Uh, she married Withnell. Uh, the Hancocks and the Withnells went up uh, apparently in a lighter uh, to a place um, which is now known as, as Cossack. Uh, and they landed there. They were the first, uh, they, they were in the first expedition that went up there. And from there, they turned around and uh, uh, took up land and so on and so forth. Um, Mrs. Withnell is pretty well known as the mother of the uh, Northwest, and she was a Miss Hancock, yes, that is correct. What influence do you think your education had? You were one of those boys, presumably, who were sent down from the station to be a boarder at Hale School, were you? Yes, that, that was uh, uh, correct. I did f well at Hale still, as a matter of fact, scholastically. Um, I um, 
was runner up ducks of the school and so that when I went on the station instead of going to university I was a big disappointment to my father. Uh, my father had no education, he couldn't even do long division so that's where he finished and naturally he thought that, uh, uh, that um, I should become another Einstein. Uh, he liked the, in other words, he liked the idea of somebody in the family uh, having academic honours. Well, I had different ideas and uh, I don't regret that I have, did have them and still have them. Mm -hmm. I see in your study you have a photograph on the wall of Rod Marsh taking a, an impossible wicketkeeper's catch. Why did you choose that to be one of your mementos on the wall? Well, well um, I was not a, a gifted athlete like um, uh, my double cousin Sir Valston Hancock. I had to struggle hard to make the first 11 and struggle hard to make the first 18 in, in cricket and football. So um, I knew quite a lot about cricket and what a hard game it is really to play. It looks easy when you see it on TV. And um, I thought that um, that um, uh, spectacular catch, uh, catch of marshes was something out of this world. I know how difficult it was to try and do that. I tried wicket keeping once for, for the Hales Guild and I wasn't much good. I thought you might have the build of a wicket keeper. Well, <laughs> certainly Rod, Rod Marsh seemed to have overcome his weight in that respect. <laughs> uh, what sort of vision have you got for the, the future of the North West as somebody who obviously loves it? Well, I, I think it is, um, I incline to agree with the Russian ambassador that it is the, the Pearl of Australia. Uh, this is the Pilbara. Um, he said, made three remarks, um, that it will, anyhow, well, one remark was that he, re he, re he referred to it as the Pearl of Australia. Secondly, he said, what bloody fools the British were ever to give away such a colony. And the third remark that he made that doesn't apply so much was there that there would never be any uranium um, shipped out of Australia. Um, he might be truer than he really knows when that final nuclear question is settled. Um, so I do believe that that is where the wealth of Australia uh, will come from. Uh, when you think of the iron ore that I discovered in value, if you mind, in total wealth of it, in total tonnage that is there, which is 125 million a million tons, enough to, enough to last the whole world, not just Japan, for centuries and centuries, the actual value of that iron, if you could sell it all, is worth more than the Saudi oil. Now that is sitting up uh, there and nobody, and I repeat nobody, really realises the value uh, and what it is to Australia. Uh, before I found the iron, it was regarded that Australia only had sufficient iron ore for the last some 30, 35 years, and that by the year 1965, we would be importing iron ore. Well now, the position has changed where we have gone from a position of having, you might say, no iron ore to being the world's largest producer, or exporter rather, of iron, not the producer, the world's largest exporter of iron ore. And it has transform, transformed really the Australian economy because prior to that, Australia was a one industry nation. It was carried on the sheep's back. And here we are, we've transferred ourselves to transformed ourselves to where we have a very, the, I think the largest export now just about from Australia, certainly from Western Australia is iron ore. So there's a big transformation going on now. If you look at that and build, if you build on that, there's no worth, uh, the, remember that everything comes out of the earth. You either mine it or you grow it. And remember that the whole of Western civilization is built on mining so that there's nothing that you can make that doesn't come out of the ground and that Western civilization at the moment gets practically all of its minerals, particularly strategic mineral from Africa and the way that a lot of people are looking at, particularly politicians are looking at Africa 
And the way the Russians look at Africa, the Russians realize the value of what Africa is to the Western world, and our people do not seem to realize that. So that if Africa does go out for one reason or other, the next great raw resource part of the world is the Pilbara. Now I believe that this is not only our industrial base, that with it Australia could be the America of the 21st century, but I believe it's our only means of, of total defence. 14 million people, there's no way can they afford an adequate defence force to cover an area like Australia. From exercises done in the Pilbara, when we lent the people Whitnam accommodation there, the army and that, from exercises done of that, it shows that the total defence capa capability of the whole of Australia, all their, all their forces, can defend at the most 12 mine, miles of Australian coastline. Western Australia has 4,400 miles of coastline. So how on earth are you going to defend it? I believe that the thing to do is to make Australia indispensable to several of the big nuclear powers in the same way that today um, we are indispensable to Japan. And much as the Australian people might, might uh, be horrified at the very idea, the only defence that Australia has got today is Japan. They cannot afford to see us go under because they're in, their total economy is built on Australia. The iron ore, bauxite, manganese, you name it, they've got to have it. And it comes from Australia, so they've got to defend Australia. But I believe, instead of being totally dependent upon Japan, not only for defence but for trade, that if several of the big nuclear powers were dependent on us, as they are dependent on Africa, they would not be able to let any one nation, particularly a minor nation, come in here and, and take us over. In their own self-interest, they would have to look, look after us. I do not believe, for instance, because we speak the same language and so on and so forth, that any nation will come and look after us. I do not believe that America will defend anything west of Hawaii. I do not believe that Britain has the capability to defend us. So at the moment, we're entirely on our own. And I think the sooner that we realize that, the better, and realize that what means of defense, that our minerals are our only means of defense if we develop them properly. So that's why I attach such tremendous importance to the Pilbara. It was your discovery of those minerals, of course, which got the whole thing going. One of the mysteries, it seems to me, is why it was that when the Portuguese and the Dutch in their old maps marked off that area as the Provincia Arifera, I've got a map of 1652 which is marked like that, mm. why it was it took 300 years for us to confirm what they already knew? Well, I very much doubt what they did, <laughs> what they, I very much doubt that they knew really very much about it. But um, it's, um, that iron ore, according to geologists, was laid down not 300 years ago, but 1,700 million years ago. So the mystery deepens or is extended to that extent. Um, we've heard of people knowing something about the, um, the iron ore previously. Uh, well, there is no record of any geologist ever having gone through the Hammersley Ranges uh, and, and discovered any iron ore. Any of the, any of the um, areas that they did traverse, there's been no commercial deposit of iron ore found either by them or since then on any of those routes that they, tra the routes that they traversed. Um, so I don't put any credence in any sort of casual remark that you know, it was an iron province or something of that nature. They were not referring to the Hammersley Rain. And one fellow, Woodward, I think it was, was referring to an iron province, I think it was down on the Murchison somewhere. That actually, it was in the Murchison. As far as the early explorers are concerned, well, they didn't, they didn't go inland. Um, the best of my knowledge, they land on a place called the Puke, an island, Basalt Island, barren. Uh, um, which couldn't possibly have any life on it. 
so that they knew that they landed on there, there would be, be no hostile uh, people to greet them. Uh, Dampier beached his, his, um, his boat, where well, is now the port of Dampier. Um, and there's no commercial deposits of iron ore anywhere around there, otherwise Hammersley Iron, which has spent something like a thousand million dollars, um, would have grabbed that up. So I think you can discount most of those sort of stories. You became a sort of accidental mining magnet, really, didn't you? Because you were a pastoralist who happened to fly your aircraft up the Turner River, by, well, by forced by the weather. How did you feel when you suddenly realized that um, your whole life was going to be changed by this? I didn't realize uh, that at all, but uh, my first um, uh, effort probably at um, mining was um, the, the, the development of the blue asbestos, blue asbestos industry. Um, um, when I was a child, you know, when I was like 12 and 14, somewhere around about there, uh, or 10 or 12 at 14 of school, I had to go up the Whitnam Gorges and it's an ideal place, you know, to play bush rangers and hunt dingoes and so on and so forth. And I'd see this asbestos, blue asbestos, what they call floaters. Um, uh, otherwise, little bits of rock with asbestos in them been eroded, uh, you know, from obviously the main ore body. And um, I'd, when I left school, I wrote down to the mines department and to Hardy's and asked the value of the stuff. And they said, oh, it's 18 pounds a tonne. I was thinking it cost 30 to even freight it down there. So there wasn't much future in that. And it wasn't until a fellow called Islewyn Walters, a mining engineer from the Asbestos, Molybdenum and Tungsten Company, came out from England. And I had one of these floaters, a very nice one, with seams of asbestos in it, um, um, as a sort of a doorstop on the homestead of Mulga Downs. Asked him what the value of it was. He said, 70 pounds a ton. I said, don't be silly. He said, I'll pay 70 pounds a ton. Well, of course, that was a totally different story. So I scratched up the gorge just like a goanna and pegged out where I knew where the best of the deposits were. And that happened to be Whitnam Gorge. Uh, and that um, started off the blue ass asbestos uh, industry by my, uh, well, previous to that, the blue asbestos industry, the only known commercial deposits were in Africa. And they were hand work. The, they had to nap the rock off the asbestos by hand with little hammers. And this is really what happened when Walters said he would buy, pay 70 pounds a ton for the stuff. Uh, a lot of fellows came down, some 300 or so, and moved in there like a gold rush. And they used to gouge the stuff out and hammer the rock off it um, and um, uh, put it in bags and they'd sell it to, to Walters for so much a bag, I've forgotten what it was. And these fellows got very proficient at napping this off. And you get a one bag man, you get a two bag man, you get a three bag man, just like a shearer. Can shear, you know, a gun shearer, because one can shear 100 sheep a day and a gun can shear 200 sheep a day. So the, the three bag man used to puff his chest out. He was something of, you know, there was a sort of a pecking order for one bag man, two bag man, three bag man. Well, that went on for a while and until I turned around in the workshop at Mulga Downs, I devised a machine um, for doing this instead of sitting down painfully uh, napping the rock, devised a machine for doing it. And at that time, there was an urgent demand for the gas masks uh, in, in the United States. That they believed that the German war machine was making a lot of gas and that war was imminent and that uh, it would be just as well to be prepared. And the ideal thing for this filtering medium in this, um, these gas masks they wanted was blue asbestos. 
So I established a small market in blue asbestos. I established this machine and um, was doing quite well uh, out of it. And um, it, it, we're making about 900 pounds a, um, a week, which is a terrific thing in, in those days. And um, uh, Mr. E. A. Wright, who was at school with me at Hale School, um, he virtually ran himself into the ground and came up north for a holiday to stay with me for two or three weeks. And he saw this machine that I had devised and he saw what was going on and nothing would stop him other than to join forces with me. And we've been together ever since. Um, so my first venture into mining really, I suppose, was um, that's transformed me from pastoral to mining. And then I took more interest and so on and so forth. I then went into a gold mine and I found out that um, um, most of the money went down the hole instead of coming out of it. So I gave gold mining away at a very early, uh, early, early stage. When did you first start doing aerial reconnaissance? Ah, um, after, um, well, prior to the discovery of the iron ore, um, some time back, I learned to fly and have my own aeroplane. And um, I um, used to use that and um, oversee, you might say, uh, a copper mine that we had, a lead mine that we had, a tin mine that we had, um, and work it all from an asbestos mine, a white asbestos mine known as Nunnery. Now I was camped there uh, with my wife um, at this asbestos mine that, um, that, that, we were, that I was Hancock and Wright were working. And it was in a very narrow gorge. And when the summer rains came, um, the, we all had to sort of pack up and go because you couldn't get in and out of the place except by aeroplane. So from that um, uh, from that base, um, I used this plane, had managers on each of these mines, and I used to go, go around. For instance, to go to the copper mine, it was only 40 miles over the hill. To go by road, it was 300 miles around. So uh, uh, it didn't have to be, and he didn't have to be very wise to see that the only thing to do in that country was an aeroplane. And it was from that base, that Nunnery base, that I actually found the, um, uh, found the iron. Uh, and um, uh, we used to pack up just as the summer was approaching. Well, this particular day, uh, we were a bit late and we got caught. Um, in those days, I mean, the most formidable flying country in Western Australia, particularly for single-engine aircraft. Um, it was the Hammersley Rangers, and um, clouds built up, and with the small aircraft, there was no way that I could climb above the clouds, so the case would go under them. And um, in going under them, um, the only way out of the predicament was to go through a gorge, the Turner River Gorge, because I knew that opened out onto the Ashburton River. And going through this gorge, I saw the world, the, the, what appeared to me to be solid iron. But anyhow, later on in the winter, we came back to open the mine again. And one day I got in the plane and thought I'd have a look at this place. And I did look at it, I found it. And then I was able to trace with the plane um, that this ore body went for 70 miles, and I followed along from the plane from 70 miles, and I just assumed that seeing that Australia was officially had no iron ore in it, that it must have been low grade and it was a lot of rubbish. So I managed to bump myself down in the patch of Spinifex, where it wasn't so thick in the little plane, walk across, took some samples, and to my surprise, they were 2% higher than the standard blast furnace feed of the mightiest nation on earth, the United States. So I knew that it was not only large, but it was high grade. 
Well, from then I developed, I saw how handy the airplane was to locate them, uh, iron ore and trace out iron ore. I went from that, continued on from there and I found more and more and more and various deposits and so on and uh, uh, so forth. And it became quite a handy tool. Uh, with it, I found a whole lot of iron ore, and I found manganese, and so on and so forth. So, what happened to the plane? Unfortunately, I didn't sort of realise that it might have been, uh, from the family's point of view, it might have been of some historic interest. I sold the plane, and um, later on, I went to buy it back and found out that it had um, changed hands several times. And unfortunately, the last person that got hold of it couldn't fly very well and he killed himself which is um, and killed two or three other couple of other people with him the, the airplanes these days they're um, um, they don't teach people to fly they teach them to drive just to drive around the sky well those planes in those old days they weren't aerodynamically perfect like these ones so it's impossible to hurt yourself what sort of plane was it it was an oster um, and it was a for that type of work, it was as good a plane as you get because it was made of tubular steel and it was covered with aeroplane silk. So my standard procedure was to, uh, at places I'd have to squeeze into a very short space and if I tore the wings on a mulga tree or something like that, I'd always had carried some uh, aeroplane silk, needle and cotton and some dope. And you could always, at least I always did anyhow, patch myself up and I always carried an axe because if I got into too small a place, then I had to cut some trees down to get out and so on and so forth. So an axe, a water bag, uh, some airplane silk, a needle and thread, uh, and some dope, and you're in business. Now you can't do that to a metal plane. So, uh, on some, so I think the Oster, and it would, it would carry a staggering amount of considering its size in load. Um, I had in that little aeroplane an, an oxyacetylene buckle, which is about 300 um, pounds, a man sitting on top of it, and myself, and uh, away we've gone. Now you can't do that except with a plane much bigger. So the Oster was a remarkable machine. And is that the plane that your partner gave you was a souvenir in silver? Yes, seeing that the original was, um, seeing that the original was burnt up um, to, um, so as, as a memento from a family, uh, my partner had made a very nice silver model absolutely exact of that plane. And I have that at home today, mounted on two great big chocks of, of iron ore. So that, oh, I was very grateful for that, or at least my family will be, I should imagine. Talking of your family, for someone who is in such a public position as yourself, how have you managed to keep your family life so separate and so private? Well, th this is something that I uh, aim to do, and my daughter has um, done her level best to do the same, to do the same thing. Because um, I get a whole lot of um, threatening letters, nasty letters, and so on and so forth, and it's not fair to. It's all right f for me, but it's not fair to pass that sort of burden on to the uh, to my family. I'm led in the saddle to anybody, any political party or any movement or so on and so forth. If they, the best way to kill that movement was to associate my name with it. So I don't think that anybody should pass it on to their family. Mm. Why do you think that you uh, stir up this opposition? I don't deliberately do it, but I think um, um, government, particularly in Australia, and Australians are apathetic. Um, um, and this applies largely to the news media. Uh, they don't want news. They want sensationalism. And if you've got any message, if you pass it over, well, it just hits the waste paper basket. Uh, but if you say something controversial amidst it, um, they'll all uh, print it, doesn't matter how wild it is or uh, what it is. Uh, and that will, of course, might give you then give you a chance to answer something and in the answer of it you quite often you can state a case which otherwise would never it would never see the light of day mm. you always seem to resist the temptation though which you might well have succumbed to of buying popularity i mean you, you've never sort of 
built a concert hall or saved the opera company or anything like that. Um, is that just because you have decided to stay private in your own business? No, I, I just don't think that. Um, uh, I just don't think that um, anyone should um, sort of buy publicity for themselves. I, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I mean, uh, I know a lot of people look at it differently, but I, I just don't. Um, I think if uh, the best way to spend your money is on something constructive, what I regard as constructive, not in those avenues. I can't see any point in that. You're one of these lucky people, really, for whom your uh, mining career is your hobby as well, isn't it, to a large extent? Yes, yes. I, I believe that, um, um, that the best in sort of um, interest that you can get is something that oh, I don't know about interest. The best way you can fill in your time is doing something useful and interesting, I would think. Uh, that's, um, there'd be no sense in just accumulating money and then sitting on a pile of money in Switzerland, for instance, like I could quite easily do. I don't think you get any satisfaction out of that. You've, um, of course, I think you coined the phrase eco-nuts, didn't you, to deal with the people who were um, worried about the ecology, but for somebody who uh, speaks out against that sort of thing. You obviously have a tremendous love for the open spaces and the country itself. Yes, the people what that are in these movements don't under, don't understand the end result um, of what they're um, of what they're doing. Um, well, for instance, there's something like 4,000 million people on this earth. There's a thousand million of them. Don't get enough to eat. A lot of them dying, and so on and so forth. And the only way that they can be fed is by wholesale development and the utilization of the raw resources of this earth. As I go back to it, everything comes from the earth. You either mine it or you grow it. Now you can't even grow it until you mine the iron to make the power shears and so on and so forth. The implements and tools of trade. You couldn't take this TV interview, for instance, where everything that you're using and utilizing here comes out of the earth. So that if those thousand million people are not going to die each, and they're not, go, they're not going to live each year or live decently each year, it is because the productive capacity of this earth has been reduced by people saying, oh, you mustn't dig this hole here, it's, you know, it's not beautifying, and so on and so forth. That's one thing. The second thing is that we are undergoing a very great depression now. And if you analyze the reason for that depression, you'll trace it back to the Econuts and their attitude or their influence in the United States. Quite unwittingly, they haven't, didn't do it wittingly, but quite unwittingly. And the reason for that is that the United States, which is the largest economy in the world, used to be an exporter of oil. The ecology movement got control there, so that there was this legislation was brought in and regulations were brought in, which meant that the United States of America, instead of being an exporter of oil, became an importer of oil. For instance, the Alaska pipeline was put back you know, five years. There are all sorts of restrictions on coal mining, exhaust from motor cars, and so on and so forth. To build a nuclear power plant, which of course is the real answer, it took 11 years instead of three because of getting site clearances and so on and so forth. They had to build islands in the sea, and all this sort of business with the result that America became a very large importer of oil, and they were competing then for the limited supply, whatever supply of oil there was in the world, with nations, big industrial nations that had none. That is Germany, Japan, and so on and so forth. Consequently, with America entering this limited market, OPEC was formed, and they were able to then multiply the price of oil to everybody four times, with the result that 
the big trading nations of the world that had no oil, had to reserve or use up their foreign exchange simply to buy oil to keep their industry going. Consequently, they couldn't buy anything else. So that the world trade is contracted. And with that result, we've got this deepening depression because nobody's buying. They haven't got the money to buy. They've used to use up oil. Now, that is a direct consequence, end result of ecology. So, uh, ecology gone wild. So you ask me why I uh, are against that sort of thing. That is a particular reason. But at the same time, you obviously like the station country and the, and the wilderness as well. Yes, th th that is so, but I don't like it to the extent of a thousand million people dying. You've got to get a balance in the, the thing. You've got to look at the end result of these things, and you've got to look a long way ahead, which, ought to, which I believe people don't do. You've been immensely lucky in that you've had a tremendously interesting life and you've done a lot of things that most people would give their eyes to do. But is there anything that you would like to have done that you haven't been able to do? Yes, I've, um, I admit that I've had a very interesting life in, in, indeed. Um, uh, I've, um, I've met a lot of interesting people as a result of it. I believe my biggest disappointment is that Having met one of the most interesting persons in the world, um, Mr. D.K. Ludwig, the world's richest man, I persuaded him to come out here, and um, I flew him in a single engine aircraft. He wished to sort of preserve a certain, he didn't want to be written up by the newspaper. So, I picked him up in the north of Australia, flew him down through the iron fields, down here to Perth, and introduced him to our government of the day. I persuaded Ludwig to offer to build a one central railway, one giant port, and order six ships three times the size of those currently in use in the iron trade. That order alone was the equivalent of 26 Queen Marys. Um, that was before there were any mines, any railroads, any ports established in Pilbara. Now, and he was, he was going to finance it. Furthermore, he was to go back through Germany and finance the German steel industry, or a section of it, to expand to take the ore that we were going to produce from this. The state government knocked that back, with the result that you've today got four different railways, four different groups, four small ports, or comparatively small ports, which are which are of such dimension only that they can only trade with Japan. So that Australia, even though we've got 47% of the Japanese market, we've got less than 10% of the world's market. And the world's market is probably six times bigger than the Japanese market. Now had we had this scheme adopted of Ludwig's, one central railway, giant port, everybody being able to use the railway and the port, and ships three times bigger than are currently in use, we would have had not 47% of the Japanese market, we'd have had 47% of the world's market, or even more, because we have the ore um, to support such, a, such an industry. Well, now, the state government turned that down. And to me, that's the biggest disappointment that I think that we've ever had. Of course, it's a disappointment that Western Australia's had, but of course, they don't realise it, and they probably never will realise it. But that, to me, is a tragedy for Western Australia. Do you know why they knocked it back? No, it's a cabinet decision. They tell me is um, uh, must be secret. The reason was because they didn't understand uh, what it was, and that's one reason. And second because Hancock has led in the saddle and it was put up through Hancock and Wright by Ludwig. It was, our, it was my idea. Ludwig endorsed it, 
and he put it up through us. So that is the reason. Is that what's at the heart then of the obvious antagonism between you and Sir Charles Court? That is it, yeah. Mm. I believe that this is the greatest tragedy that's ever befallen and not only Western Australia but Australia. And what about your own personal satisfactions? What would you like to do apart from what you were doing officially? Well, I'm still, I haven't, that was in 1964, uh, and I still haven't given up hope of getting the down, uh, uh, the centralised, uh, what we call the downhill railway giant port uh, built at the place called Ronside, which is, a, which is where Ludwig was, we were going to bring Ludwig. I haven't given up hope of one day uh, being able to bring that about, and I'm still trying to bring that about because that is the only way that I can see that Australia will ever get out of the, the Japanese net. We're so totally controlled by Japan, and these iron companies that have been set up are so totally controlled by Japan, and our, and, uh, our industry is so dependent upon Japan, I've said a thousand times, that if Japan sneezes, we get pneumonia. Now, I believe with all the wealth that Australia has got, it's in the ground, of course, there's no earthly reason why um, we should be beholden to the Japanese. The world should be beholden to us, is the way I look at it. So what we're really seeing is the, the true Lang Hancock, you never give up. Well, I'm certainly not giving up on that one. <laughs>